All right, it's good to be with you again. Uh, this is an interesting topic for me. Um, uh, as I mentioned, my first session uh, in Israel, I'm giving 12 sessions on taking to the streets Israeli protest uh, movement. Um, but this one is the one I feel closest to because I was in the first Lebanon war uh, and the topics that we're going to be speaking about, I was there when the things were happening. So that really always gives a different kind of um, feeling to it. So um, just to a little bit of myself and I want to make a general comment about Israel, which I think those of you who know the country well uh, realize that. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Um, that is the, when you're in Israel, you're, you're involved in it. Uh, it it's, it's a different kind of country, maybe because we're small and maybe because we're, we're young. But uh, all our friends, whenever we sit around together, one of the things that comes up always is that we've all felt that we've done something for the country. It's a very interesting kind of feeling. Um, those of us in, in the army spend time in the army world. That's obviously one realm. But even if it wasn't that, many of us, and I think I, I know very few people who haven't been involved in protest movements in this country, They're from the left or the right or whatever it is, but a feeling that you, uh, when you're here, you have to be involved. And I think this is something which um, I, I don't know if one necessarily feels that in many other countries of the world. Uh, in this particular case, my personal involvement covered uh, a number of subcomponents. Uh, when the war broke out, uh, it was called Operation Peace for the Galilee, sometimes called the First Lebanon War. Um, my unit was called up. I was at, at that time in a long distance uh, radio telephone unit. Um, and we were called up and we were uh, about to go into war with Syria. So there we were in the northern part of Israel, uh, connected to a very, very large uh, tank brigade. And we were expecting to go in against uh, Syria, but uh, Israel destroyed the uh, SAM missile, the SAM missiles, in addition to about 25 Syrian airplanes. And, and then Syria chose non-involvement. So it's, it's, it's kind of one of these strange situations. You suddenly think you're going into a war and what are you actually finding? You find that uh, within a few hours, you're not involved in war. So they kept us uh, at the base. I was in the reserves at that time, kept us at the base for a bit and then sent us home. A few weeks later, we were called up again. And this was really the interesting part because they took us to Nabatia. Nabatia is in Southern Lebanon, not too far from the coast. And it's a Shiite center. You know, the Shiites are um, about 15% of the Muslim world, the large group of the Sunnis. And Nabatia was a very tough area because they have some of the important ceremonies there, um, religious ceremony, ceremonies, which, are, which are make it a very um, tense kind of area. So uh, we were based in, uh, in Nabatia there. And it was interesting for me because in the particular army job that I had, which was uh, a sitting in a kind of a, a little, a, a basically a, 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 a communications container uh, with a massive amount of equipment. We would sit there for about four or five hours and then we would have a number of hours free. There were two or three of us um, over 20, involved over 24 hours. And on the free time, because we were in the middle of, the, of Nabatea in the city, I actually got to know some Lebanese families. So it's an unbelievable experience when I'm thinking back now, uh, almost 40 years, um, of being a soldier with a, a gun, going over and having a cup of tea or a cup of coffee with the local Lebanese population. And I really do like the Lebanese. I mean, there's something very, very nice about them. Uh, and now that I'm watching what's going on in Lebanon, the city in crisis, um, you know, I feel very close to, to them. Uh, they might have been the enemy in the war. Some of them are the enemy, uh, but I feel very close to them. What's important for this particular presentation that the uh, central suburb of Shatila event, um, which I'll be talking about, we were actually listening on our radios because the information that went from the front line, which at that particular moment was the uh, refugee camp of Sabra and Shatila, 
went through our particular communication center, and then it was sent on to headquarters in Tel Aviv. So we were sitting there listening, and at the, at the beginning, it was very, very confused. And only many months later uh, did I really work out what happened, because you're getting all this kind of information coming through without knowing exactly what was happening. Uh, a little while later, I'd been transferred to the education unit in the army, and the army sent me once again into southern Lebanon because the Israeli army, the education unit, is very, very concerned about soldiers knowing what they're doing. So uh, both for reserve soldiers and for regular army soldiers, the Israeli army is committed to making sure that the people knowing what they're doing and why they're doing it. And regardless of their political points of view, the feeling is that if you have the real story, and I must tell you in the many, many uh, years that I was in this particular unit, the education unit, on no occasion did anyone ever tell me what I should say. So this was kind of, it's not a propaganda unit, um, but it's really is an education unit. And therefore the army wanted me to um, tell the soldiers who'd either been in Lebanon to kind of do a, a ex explanation, you know, what did you see? What did you feel? What didn't you understand? Or in the case of soldiers who were still going in to the Southern area, to the security zone, to have a good sense of what they're going into. Now, the Lebanese uh, situation is unbelievably complex. And I'm really only gonna cover a few elements. And because of that, you can see my email address. If you have any ad additional questions, which aren't covered in, in the chat, please contact me because Lebanon as a story is multi-leveled and I'm only going to be taking a few components. Uh, co co components. One of the um, uh, interesting co uh, elements that we did in the education unit was that the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, had produced a very controversial movie uh, called Ricochet in, in English and Stay at Sport with Sidon, Two Fingers from Sidon, which is a city on the, on the western coast, um, which was used for analysis by officers and soldiers. Why was it a con uh, controversial? Because it was actually a critical movie of the army. Uh, but the, uh, this particular unit which had made the movie said, you know, we want people to grapple with the real issues and because the presence in Lebanon was so controversial, um, it was important to hear different uh, perspectives. Here we see um, myself giving a lecture at a certain time. We see the city of Nabatea down there. It's a very closed kind of uh, um, city, um, interesting place all in all. And uh, on the side, we've got uh, the picture of the movie uh, of this uh, um, very, I, I think, wonderful movie. By the way, if you ever have a chance to see the movie, it's, it's not regularly available. Uh, I'm sure you'll find it uh, uh, fascinating at the same time challenging. So just a little bit of the background. Um, Lebanon is one of those countries where uh, when you use the word complex, you really know what you're talking about because on absolutely every level, Lebanon doesn't fit into the general definition of a, what we might call a regular country, whatever that is. You know, you have the Sunnis and the Shis and the Druze and the Christians. And then, you know, that sounds, oh, that's just a few groups, but each of them have their many, many sub uh, divisions. So it's essentially which uh, country from about the 1860s, which has been uh, caught not only by internal issues, but by external issues. Syria has been very involved on a significant number of occasions and Israel itself, uh, some years before this particular war uh, in the Litani operation was involved. And then in 1982 until uh, the year 2000, uh, we were involved also. So it both has internal issues and external issues. The reason why um, Israel went into the war is that the uh, Israeli ambassador in the United uh, Kingdom, Shlomo Argov, had been uh, uh, seriously wounded by some Palestinians. And at that time, um, Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, who, by the way, we'll be hearing about once again next week because he was such a dominant kind of figure, he um, was interested in 
defeating the PLO, the Palestinian, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Um, and therefore he was the most aggressive person uh, in the Likud government of the time, uh, pushing uh, Israel eventually to uh, Beirut. Um, Beirut, by the way, is a, a beautiful city um, for many, many years considered the Paris of the Middle East. Now, a short time afterwards, um, Israel's uh, close colleague, President Bashir Jamal, um, who is a, um, a phalangist, I'll, I'll mention the phalangist in a moment, um, was assassinated together with a, a, a significant group of followers. And initially it was uh, unclear who was responsible. It was believed to be the Palestinians. But the Palestinians, besides the local uh, Lebanese group, there are a considerable number of Palestinians in uh, Lebanon who had initially been in many cases in Jordan, but as a result of conflict between the Palestinians and the Jordanian Hashemite monarchy were pushed out of Jordan many years earlier, and some of them found themselves in uh, Lebanon. The, um, this um, brought Israel into a new situation, and the uh, involvement in Sabran Shatila was because um, the Christian phalanges were close allies of Israel. Uh, afterwards, the relationship soured, but at that particular moment, they were our close uh, allies. In fact, I meant, met uh, quite a few of the phalanges, uh, people in, mainly in the intelligence unit, uh, very, very, um, very Western, very sophisticated. Some of them who had had close relationships with Israel even became uh, very Israeli in a kind of sense. They loved going to Israel, they, they enjoyed Tel Aviv and things like that. However, we, we're concentrating on a, another uh, particular issue. Between June uh, 1982 and May 1985, significant number of Israelis were killed, over 1,200. And Israel was really, in a sense, caught um, uh, where that uh, many Israeli soldiers were being killed, also where that there was tremendous division within Israeli society, which we'll come to a little later. So uh, by 1985, Israel withdraws from a large area and comes to the uh, security zone, which we see here. Uh, later on, when I'd gone into Lebanon, I was spending some time here in the security zone. And uh, until uh, the year 2000, we were in the security zone. Uh, in, and in that particular year, we eventually left uh, 18 years in Lebanon, which makes us, which makes this particular war our longest one. Now, Within the Lebanese society, you have uh, these, uh, not only do you have the division Sunni, Shi'i, Druze, Christian, and also the um, external group, the Palestinians, you also have the very, very tense political uh, tensions which have existed for an extended, extended period of time in Lebanon. So on the one hand, you have the Christian uh, conservative uh, group, dominated by the Maronites, but there are another six other Christian groups of different Christian sects which exist also. And in some cases, there have been um, almost war between one Christian group and another Christian group. So this kind of gives a sense of the uh, very, very difficult situation. In, in Israel's case, the close relations we had with the Phalanges from 1982 was very important. And part of what happened to Israel it was caught in the internal battle in Lebanon, uh, which uh, we'll be talking about. There were also the Islamic forces, the leftist groups, uh, Islamic forces who kind of right as the leftist group, uh, Palestinians, um, and they were sort of formed into one section. And then there was another group which afterwards became important for Israel, and that was a group that had been formed in 1978, the Free Lebanon Army, which were actually uh, deserters under Saad uh, Haddad, this gentleman over here. Now, we're talking about protests. Uh, one of the components we have in, in uh, Israel, at uh, this particular case, was a, an individual protest, a very unusual individual protest by Colonel Eli Gever. Uh, 
which attracted a tremendous amount of attention. Even many, many years later, we, we hear uh, Israelis remembering clearly the uh, Eli Geva story. So just a little bit about uh, him. As a uh, young uh, brigade commander, uh, a colonel, at the age of 32, he was actually seen at the age of 32 to uh, quote uh, Chief of Staff uh, Eitan, one of the most, if not the most, outstanding officers of the war. So Eli Geva was one of those kind of guys. You, you have them until today in the army, you see them fairly young, uh, very, very um, uh, dynamic, clever people who have studied, who are, are going to be the kind of people who the Israeli army would like to reach the top uh, ranks of, of, um, of the IDF. Now, uh, Geva had been involved and was happily involved in the early stages uh, of the entry into um, into Lebanon, uh, because from his perspective, the PLO was the major enemy, and here was an action, was a, a, a possibility that the PLO would be uh, destroyed, by the way, in the long, long the short of the PLOs, that they were in Beirut and eventually left Beirut and in large sections uh, spent some time in Tunisia with many years later, uh, Yasser Arafat uh, coming back to Gaza. Now, in, in July 1982, there was uh, a, a, about to, uh, to be action against uh, uh, Beirut. And at that particular moment, and uh, here we can see the city of Beirut, the beautiful city over here, divided between many subsections on the, uh, in the coastal area. Um, the orders were being prepared to have an attack on the city of Beirut. And... Um, he didn't want to disobey orders to attack Beirut and because, and I would quote him, I don't have the heart to look bereaved parents in the eye and tell them their sons died in an operation I felt was unnecessary. On that basis, in the middle of a war, and this was already the war, but it wasn't yet the attack on Beirut, which actually turned out to be uh, a very problematic uh, activity, he resigned. Now, in many situations and in many armies, and when, when I was in the education unit, we were um, looking into this whole study, that would almost be uh, uh, something, you know, a, a court case against you. I mean, how can you in a war just suddenly decide to, uh, you don't want to be involved in it, and the, the possible impact on your soldiers could be tremendous. So we talked about a, a very serious issue. This isn't civilian life. This is uh, military life in the middle of a war. What happened in the Israeli case, I think, says a great deal about the, um, the better part of army, any army. He was invited by Prime Minister Begin to have a 45-minute discussion. So he wasn't given, taken to court or anything like that. Uh, and in this 45 minute discussion with Prime Minister Begin, he explained why he felt he could not take the troops into, into battle uh, and, uh, and be involved in what would essentially be in West uh, Beirut. So uh, th this, this brought about a, a massive discussion within Israeli society. But I want to give you the response of the Israeli left. Um, um, clearly, the Israeli right was horrified. But what was the position of the Israeli left? And here I want to quote uh, Mordechai Baron, who actually I got to know because at a certain time I worked with the World Zionist Organization and Baron was the head of our particular unit. He was the a Peace Now spokesman, very defined leftist. Uh, and... Uh, he, he, his uh, feeling on the Geva resignation was that he had hoped that the Geva's action would not set an example of disobedience in the army or draft dodging. Here you have a leader of the best known Israeli leftist movement of the time saying, well, what Geva has done, someone who may be in Baron's own mind, uh, had carried out uh, an important, had made an important decision, this was going to be uh, worrying from a military perspective and 
uh, as Baron stated, the army uh, must obey the government. And he continued, we don't want to, to corrode the army. The Israeli Defense Forces are still a precious value for the existence of the state. And I bring this up because I think once again, many of the um, protest movements that I've been talking about are not only important for the actual protest itself, but I think they're good case studies in understanding what um, Israel, modern Israel is essentially all about. Uh, some years later, uh, Geber uh, reports that he received letters and calls from army officers who had told him, I understand now what you were saying. This is part of the Israeli society, very much in the education unit that I mentioned. Um, we uh, always uh, encourage uh, discussion. And here we have yet another member, uh, Mayor Pa'il, another member of the left. And he actually commented, he made a, a comment that he thought that possibly 15% of the Israeli officers had supported Geva, but none of them had actually resigned uh, at, in the middle of action. Now we come to the great crisis, uh, the Sabran Chatila massacre, September 16th to the 18th, 1982. Um, we uh, find ourselves, and you can see here uh, this very, very upsetting picture. Um, and we'll come to the numbers just in a moment. This is, these are the people who were killed in Sabran Chatila. Sabran Chatila, by the way, is a essentially Palestinian refugee camp. Uh, the Palestinians in Lebanon, although Lebanon of the Arab countries is essentially an open-minded country, uh, but they have always had very, very strict regulations against the Palestinians, and the Palestinians are not allowed to work in a considerable number of realms, so they're a marginalized, deprived group living in, uh, in, this, um, in these refugee camps. So um, what happened was after um, the president, the Falangist president had been killed and the feeling was that the Palestinians were responsible because the Palestinians had um, belonged to the uh, factions which, were, which had threatened the Christian Falangists, the believing that the Palestinians were uh, responsible, some 300 to 400 Falangists entered the camps, the two uh, camps next to each other. Uh, and there were 30 hours of summary uh, executions, house demolitions and looting of uh, private goods. Um, a very, very tough kind of situations. Um, for those Palestinians themselves, if we look at who they are, many of them were victims of the 1948 war, Palestinians who called in what we call the Israel's war of liberation, of a war of independence is, um, is, is Nakba, the um, disaster, the catastrophe in, in Arabic. So these people had been refugees, uh, in many cases having left or been forced out of Israel, spent a considerable number of years in, uh, in Jordan, afterwards as a result of the Black uh, September movement in Jordan, uh, and the conflict with the, the government and monarchy there, they were kicked out and they eventually found themselves as refugees in Lebanon. How many people were involved? And here we begin to understand some of the complexities of the Arab world and not only the challenges which Israel finds. According to the Lebanese police, there were 460 people killed. According to the Israeli intelligence, between seven or 800 killed. Now, what does that show us? That shows us actually that the, the Lebanese government and Arab governments, other Arab governments as well, and we'll see some confirmation on this in a moment, wanted to reduce the nature of the massacre. That means that for them, and understandably from their perspective, the internal conflicts between all the different Lebanese factions means that what you're going to do is, whenever possible, try and reduce the tensions. But what was it from the Israeli side? And here we have uh, a general, uh, Rafael Etan, who had been an interesting uh, general with quite a, an impressive um, uh, career, uh, army career in terms of dealing with marginal youth within the army. So 
he, he appears in this particular situation as a kind of very aggressive person, but he also had some other interesting components in terms of uh, how he looked at the world. Um, and, and he said, uh, we don't give the phalanges orders and we are not responsible for them. So here comes the whole question of Sabran Shatila. Israel was uh, present in vast amounts of Lebanon at the time, but were not the controlling force for the phalanges. The phalanges were, uh, groups worked however they wanted, as did all the other Lebanese forces. So it's not as though you have Israel as a controlling power. Israel is not in control, but Israel, has, the Israeli army is present in certain parts of Lebanon as the Syrian army is present in other parts of Lebanon. So that's the kind of situation uh, that you have. Now, the Israeli public, when they heard what was going on, responded uh, uh, in a very, very clear manner. And here we see, just get a, a bit of an idea uh, of, of uh, here we have Beirut at the top. I was uh, down, uh, more or less down here. And this, these are the, for bits further south actually. And here we have the two refugee camps, uh, Sabra and Shatila. Now, the Comments within Israeli society, it's a very vocal society. Um, I think our media is excellent um, on TV, within the, uh, within the, on the radio, certainly in the newspapers. I think you constantly, for a small country in particular, hear a, a very broad range of opinions. Zev Schiff, a well-known military correspondent, for many, many years um, um, been an active writer, uh, made the following comment, when the IDF surrounded the camps with such huge forces, it was impossible for scores of armed men to pass through without arousing our attention. So unlike Rafael Letan's comment <clears throat> that the Israeli army is, was not responsible, uh, Zev Schiff says, no, no, but we were around there, we were present. So you can't say that we didn't quite know what was going on as had been the perspective of those people who supported um, the chief of staff of the time. As the months went by and we got increasing into the summer, a growing protest movement uh, started. Um, and uh, they uh, questioned the legitimacy, the protest movement questioned the legitimacy of the war. Uh, it seemed to be that the military operation was unnecessary for Israel's survival. By the way, many people who opposed the war opposed it for that very reason. They said, this is not a war of survival. If, you, if you're attacked in a war or a war is going to uh, in, ensure your survival, then that's one thing. This was a very problematic war because as we can see, it basically brought civilians into the center. This was by and large, not totally, Israeli army facing civilians. And this was really a tremendous shock to uh, Israeli society. And thus the dissenters, those people who had opposed the government, um, uh, came out uh, very openly uh, to, protest, to, to protest. The, the, the big protest movement, massive, 400,000 participants, by the way, at that time, the Israeli population was 4 million. That's approximately 10% of the total population of the state of Israel demonstrating. Now, by any kind of analysis, by any kind of demonstration, I would imagine almost in any other country of the world, and at the moment I'm following closely the demonstrations in Cuba and, and South Africa uh, and Lebanon, and, you know, and I'm trying to get this handle on how many people are really demonstrating in any situation. This was an unbelievably large demonstration which said, once again, the Israeli population doesn't just sit at home and complain. Israelis get onto the streets. This is really the focus of this particular series. Shimon Peres, then the leader of the opposition, said there is another Israel speaking as the opposition, uh, living on its conscience, not only on its sword, a country of constructiveness and human dignity. In the big demonstration, you can see a, a um, newspaper picture there, uh, which said in Tel Aviv, it was in Tel Aviv, thousands of protesters in favor of a commission called on Begin and Sharon to go home. 
A commission. What kind of commission? And here in Israel, except for the past 12 years, during the period of the former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, we have had a significant number of very serious national commissions of inquiry. And I think we have to just take one moment to uh, emphasize what I'm talking about here. A national committee uh, commission of inquiry really uh, is attempts to take out the political component of it. It's national. In the Israeli case, in almost all cases, um, we have the uh, former member of the Supreme Court. There have been other models as well. The attempt is to get all the truth out. And or, or it's interesting in this particular case, because the uh, Commission of Inquiry was, had a, a very important component, not questioning why we had gone into the war, but the question of Sabran Shatila. Therefore, excuse me, what we're really talking about is the attack on another group, not an attack on your own society. This isn't something which is an internal Israeli issue, but the fact that the Israeli government and army would be responsible for an attack on another group in another country. That's why this particular commission of inquiry um, was uh, so uh, very important. And it brought about uh, uh, citizens' comments pushing once again, just to take one or two, uh, 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 someone from Poland who left Poland in 1933, an important period. I'm ashamed for what we've done. Uh, uh, Rachel said we came to build this country and not to wage this sort of war. That's important because this was seen as a different war, as I mentioned. Segal speaks about the idea is to return our belief in the army before we are conscripted. We want the army to, uh, to be again an army to defend Israel only. So this was why the, this particular war was so important. And Hannah Meron, a famous actress who lost her leg in a terrorist attack said, we are people from every walk of life and we demand a committee. We want to return our boys from Lebanon, which led among other things, to a whole set of fascinating uh, requests, poems. We came back from the nightmare and she ends about, please, Mr. Prime Minister, end this nightmare, end this nightmare with it really kills and not only in nightmares. This brought about um, towards the end of the year, the Khan Commission inquiry. Uh, I've studied uh, most of the commission's inquiry that we've had. Um, and by the way, we're now in Israel facing yet another National Commission of Inquiry over Mount Meron, where 45 people were killed uh, uh, up during the Chag. So um, the Israeli Commissions of Inquiry are important. And, and I think the society as a whole would agree that when something serious happens in your country, you have to open it up. You can't close it down. You can't hide it. It needs to be covered, not by a parliamentary commission of inquiry, or it has to be uh, totally a national, apolitical commission of inquiry. And the inquiry went on for a long time. Uh, there were 60 sessions and 58 uh, witnesses. Um, the, uh, the bottom line of the, the decision of the Kahan Commission, and some people were happy with it and some people disagreed with it. We can see some of the literature on the screen there. Um, uh, said that the Israeli political and military top command bears indirect responsibility. They should have foreseen the danger of a massacre. So this is a, an important language. It is not direct responsibility, but indirect responsibility. And in this particular situation, what happened after this very, very um, extensive uh, inquiry was that um, uh, only Sharon was blamed personally. He was the Minister of Defense. He had been such a central figure all the way along that it was pretty clear that he would have to bear the, the main burden. Um, he was forced to resign as Defense Minister, but uh, re remained in the cabinet as a minister without portfolio. There were also dismissals of certain, uh, um, some people, some people were already Officers were about to leave. There were uh, senior officers who were dismissed. 
And uh, Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who in, in some senses found himself in the most difficult situation because he really didn't understand what was happening. There's a massive amount of information that said he was not guilty because he was getting the information from Sharon and maybe not always understanding what that information was. So um, Prime Minister Begin was found responsible for not exercising greater involvement as Prime Minister. He sh so, so the commission said he should have been more involved. The global response was fascinating. Um, Begin said for a number of reasons that he couldn't go on. Um, it was not only the, um, the Commission of Inquiry and Sabran Shatila, but his wife was ill and there'd been some other issues. Uh, Henry Kissinger was impressed. He said, this says something very important about Israeli democracy. Um, you know, once again, it's, it's not in your own country, it's about another people. And this was considered to be uh, important. The uh, Lebanese, interestingly, uh, and it follows on from what I'd said earlier, did not investigate the massacre because the authorities wanted national reconciliation. And there are many cases in the Arab world, in, in the modern Middle East, where when there's, um, uh, unlike the Israeli situation, we're, we're different kind of countries, albeit, where we have these the National Commission inquiries, um, in many cases, there's very little analysis in within the Arab society itself. For example, in May 1985, a few years later, um, there was a Muslim attack on two Palestinian refugee camps uh, and uh, 635 were killed. We hear almost nothing about it. Uh, in October 1990, 700 Christians were killed by Syria. And once again, very little uh, commentary on that. Poem by a soldier in Lebanon, I think, expresses one perspective, certainly not all. They announced the ceasefire, but we continued to bomb the Beirut airport and the streets and the houses what is it with us? I loathe killing, I hate destroying, horrible, pitiful war. Why should we allow them to force us to be here? And what hence and when will it end the hell with war? This, these kind of comments are very important. And I use this poem because even in my own teaching in the, uh, in the education unit, I would use these kind of poems so Soldiers would understand that, that if they're having some doubts about what they're doing, um, they wouldn't act like Eli Geva. But at the same time, they, they're allowed to, and if necessary, they should feel that they're not alone in their feelings because we are in a complex part of the world and there are going to be different political perspectives. So it's always very important for uh, soldiers and officers to hear uh, to understand the complexity of many of the situations that we found ourselves in, and in this particular case, very much because of the civilian involvement. To conclude, the um, decision to leave Lebanon came from a number of different voices. Open Israeli society, out on the streets again and again and again, by the way, in, in Israel, I'm um, one of the series, one of the uh, uh, presentations in the series of uh, 12 topics is on women in, in protest movements in Israel. And it's quite remarkable to see how many women's, almost women's only protest movements there are. One of which is the four mothers. Four mothers were like the biblical matriarchs, Rachel, Miri, Ronit and Zahara. Um, and, and they came to the fore um, and I think had an influence, particularly because of a, a helicopter disaster in Israel where 73 soldiers were killed on their way to Lebanon. And there had already been a high level of criticism. There had been ongoing marches and demonstrations uh, throughout the country. Once again, I want to emphasize that demonstrators in Israel essentially cover all sections of society. So this isn't kind of a one section kind of group, but the four mothers kind of maybe feel middle class, some of, a chunk of them of that particular group were kibbutz members, but essentially I think the demonstrations in Israel over the years have covered uh, just about all groups. There was a problem, which is kind of this chauvinism of uh, Israeli society, 
where uh, there was a kind of a question, what do you women know? You haven't been there. By the way, it's untrue. Many women have served in the Israeli army and this idea that the, the army is about a man's world only, in my particular opinion, doesn't have uh, any real validity. But I think the women's voice, the full mother's voice coming at the particular time they did coming, many of their children had been in the army, by the way, and the mothers felt very, very strongly that their sons in the permanent army couldn't do what Eli Geber had done or wouldn't want to do, but they would have to be the voice of their sons and their daughters. The casualties were high. Up till the year of 2000, there'd been over 1,300 Israelis killed, particularly most of them by, as obviously in the earlier period. And uh, the, uh, the concept was, if you see, get out, and, get out of Lebanon in Hebrew, it says, you are indifferent, they are being killed. And I end with the question, which I think we still ask ourselves in, in, in Israel. In my first session uh, two weeks ago, someone asked them when we're talking about German reparations of 1952, uh, which Ari correctly defined as a kind of a, a money realm. The, the question is, you know, are these issues part of our country? And my belief, and I can't say obviously not for everyone, but my belief is that we hold our 73 years of Israeli history very close to ourselves. The number of occasions that I find myself in Israeli audience, just to give a case study a few weeks ago, uh, we had a uh, political uh, lecture in our, in our little town. And, you know, just listening to the questions of people, um, it was quite amazing to see how well Israelis actually know their history. Now, I'm not saying that every young Israelis, but older people, and I think when the young people become older, they kind of imbibe a great deal of Israeli history. It's very powerfully presented in our media, which is one of the mechanisms. And Israelis are, by and large, ongoing learners. And I think that leads to kind of this effervescent world where we ask the questions. And the hard question that we have to ask in this particular situation, and the discussion still goes on today, what did Israel gain by all those years in Lebanon? And I think that is really the fundamental question that we have to ask about this extended period in uh, the, the country to the north of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we have time for a few questions. Please chat them in. I've been reading the, the chat as we go along. I'll start with the following. Um, you, um, I'm going to share the, the source material that you shared with me for everyone in a follow-up, so people will get that. But there are two things that you may want to watch and read. One is Waltz with Bashir by Ari Fallman. Um, I actually have never seen it, but um, many people have seen it. And I don't know if you've seen it and you want to comment yeah. about it, but is it's there anything you want to say about movie. it? It's a very important movie, and I actually didn't realize it was available. If it is available, people should watch it. Excellent. It's an excellent source. Um, but it's recollections of someone who served in Lebanon, but it's done in a um, kind of a, uh, uh, it's a drawn um, film. It's a documentary, but it's done in a very That's unusual right. artistic form. It's very clever and, and very powerful. Yeah. And then I, I read Mati Friedman's book called Pumpkin Flowers, um, which I do highly recommend you read. It's a very quick and, and absorbing book about his experience in Lebanon, um, written very well. Um, so those are the two things that I wanted to kind of start with. The second thing is, um, do you think that these protest movements had the had an impact on uh, the decision to withdraw troops finally in 2000? Um, you know, or you know, how impactful were these protests? Is the question? You know, I, I think it's hard to sort of define it exactly. You know, we've just had a long period of protest to to try and remove. Um, um, Ex-Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So the, it, it, I think it's, 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 it's hard scientifically to put one's finger on it. I think what it does more than anything else, it, it creates a certain uh, dialogue in society. I think that's maybe many, one of the most important thing about a protest movement. You know, a protest movement by itself can't move a government. A, a government will only change with an election. But I think what protest movements do, and it doesn't matter whether it's a left or right or any other kind of protest movement, it, it enforces 
people to think and brings about national involvement. And I think that might be the most important uh, component. And my own point of view is that societies where people are involved in peaceful process are actually healthy societies because it means people are dealing with the issues and you can't, you're not all in the parliament, you're not all in the Senate or House of Representatives, only a few people are there. But I think the voice of the wider people besides social media uh, are, ex are important expressions. So that's how I would see the demonstration. Where it, in this particular case, the uh, four mothers coming at the end after the helicopter disaster, I think it was those two things coming together which really pushed Ehud Barak, the prime minister in that year, uh, to, to move out. So, you know, I don't know what he would have done without it, um, but we know he, he was also very worried about what, what had gone on. See, the Lebanese war had gone on for a long time. The question is, how do you stop it? There's kind of almost this inertia. And I think, therefore, the protest movement forces one to re-question what you might have taken for granted. You mentioned this and you said it, it could be a separate lecture, but did the women's involvement in the protest movement, did that empower them? Did some of them, did that empower them to go further on? Did they run for um, government in Israel? Have they made an impact, you know, oh, definitely. based on what they learned? Definitely. We see that generally speaking, that women in the protest movements have um, gained a tremendous amount of experience through the protest movements. It's a hard thing to get off the ground. Uh, you know, you have to go out to people, you have to convince people, you set up, uh, and some of the protest movements in Israel are so unbelievably sophisticated. And there's no doubt about it, of the nine women's protest movement that I've studied in detail, um, there's always a certain number of them have gone into politics or in other realms, by the way. Women are, are dominant in a very significant number of realms in Israel, and some of them have certainly been involved in protest movements at an earlier stage of their lives. But the exact percentage, no, I don't know. Can you talk about the, these, these um, committees of inquiry and how they work? We have them here in the United States, and I don't know if they work similarly. How independent are they? Who appoints them? Okay, here they, uh, as far as I know, and, and this is from all the, the many that I've read, I constantly have the feeling that these people are absolutely trying to do the best. What they do initially, um, the, uh, the, the parliament uh, appoints, in most cases, a former chief justice. Now, our Supreme Court is very different from the American Supreme Court because it, it can't be totally apolitical, but it, it's, it tends to be much more apolitical, certainly than the American case. So, so this is, you're already starting off with a, a relatively high level of respect towards the judges. It's true in Israel at the moment, that for many years, by the way, the, the hardline right wing has been very critical of the Supreme Court, but the, I think there's still generally speaking a respect. The uh, ex-judge then calls on people who will as assist her or him uh, to establish the commission. It could be often, by the way, it's a commission of three or four people. Um, in this, uh, in the current commission, it was, they took actually two judges and one military person. Um, in the coming Meron, Mount Meron commission, they actually have taken a former a chief judge, uh, I think a, um, I think a business, someone with a government background. And the third one is actually a, relig a former religious mayor uh, of B'nai Brak. So, you know, if you're doing something on a religious topic, you obviously want to bring someone who knows the field from inside. Just to take one other case study, there's a famous commission of inquiry on an Arab, um, an Arab uprising some 40 years ago. And in that particular case, among the three, they took one of Israel's top experts on, on the Arab society. So that's essentially how it's set up. So it seems to be the norm is to have a neutral judge, to have someone who's well aware of the topic, whatever the topic under discussion, and then to have someone else who will kind of probably fit between those two. 
So um, that's that's the that's the nature of commission inquiry. By the way, just to take the last one, the government was definitely against it. The prime minister, former prime minister Netanyahu, was definitely against it. The ultra orthodox leadership, political leadership, was totally against it. But um, I think in Israel's favor, that's going to be forty five people who were killed. It was totally chaotic, and therefore, once again, I think the commission inquiry will be important. Beverly Jacobs notes there's a group called Women Wage Peace, and Nancy Kaplan mentions them as well. So we'll try to find something to share. Yeah. The By the way, they are the largest of the last movements. And when I speak about a well-organized women's organization, they're absolutely the tops. They manage to get masses of people out among the things they do by the way because they're so sophisticated they constantly have people in the knesset they means that their people that are the more articulate members are there in the knesset speaking to knesset members you know trying to make sure that the politicians are well aware of uh, women wage peace by the way they also a fair amount of member male members of women's wage peace as well in our last few minutes, can you give us a quick update as to what is going on in Lebanon since you mentioned that it's a mess right now? Um, so it, it's moved from being a mess because of ethnicity. And the second stage was a mess because of Syrian involvement and a modern period because of Israeli involvement to a mess because the Palestinians got in the way to essentially today being a totally internal political mess. You have, it's uh, the, the political system in, in Lebanon is, un, is a totally unusual one. And that is that every position has to be filled from a person from that particular section of society. Just to give an example, the president of Lebanon has to be a Mar has to be a Maronite Christian. The Prime Minister of Lebanon has to be a Sunni. The Defense Minister has to be a Shi'i, and so it goes on. So you've got a totally uh, committed subsections of society, and what's happened now that the people who are the blamed for being the most corrupt are still in political power. You can't get them out. You mean you have no replacement to the political leadership uh, in Lebanon. And so that's really causing the crisis. That's brought about uh, economic problems. The, the ongoing additional problem in Lebanon is the Hezbollah uh, component who are very much influenced by Iran. So once again, you have another, yet another outside force. Today, the main problem for the average Lebanese citizen is two or three hours of electricity, almost no uh, gas, uh, almost no children's powdered food for babies, uh, almost no bread, um, absolutely chaotic. And the wider world has become so uh, disbelieving of the politicians that they don't want to give money to what is just going to go into the political cop, uh, coffers once again. By the way, France is one of the central players here. France has had a, always been very involved in Lebanon, historically speaking. And even France is saying, you know, we're not going to give any money because we really don't know where it's going to go. So this is, a, it's a tragic sort of situation. Only going to get worse, by the way, the Israeli defense minister offered to, to give assistance to Lebanon. On many occasions in the past, Leban Lebanese who've been injured in whatever situation it is, have been secretly brought into Israel to be looked after in the northern hospitals and then sent back all done very, very quietly because the last thing that anyone would want is for uh, these people to actually be found out that they had Israeli assistance. So it's done very, very secretly. So this is the crisis of Lebanon, a tragic society. And um, you know, Nancy Kaplan has been chatting quite a bit here, and this must be an issue close to her heart about you know, what happened when Israel left, in other words, unintended consequences, uh, you know, led to or related to Hezbollah coming in. 
And now yeah. we have Hezbollah on the northern border of Israel. Yeah. So, well, well, Hezbollah were there before. I mean, for many years, Hezbollah's been there. There's another uh, uh, organization called Amal. Kind of the two of them are very antagonistic towards Israel. So Hezbollah was not formed because of Israel's withdrawal, but it was strengthened. Uh, there's no doubt about it. The, the unintended consequences were uh, quite difficult because those Lebanese who had been pro-Israel, when Israel left, they found themselves in a very difficult situation. By the way, it's very comparable to what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment. We know that any Afghan person who's worked with the uh, American intelligence uh, translators or whatever other position they had, when the Americans leave, what's going to happen to these people? So what happened in Israel, there were two solutions. One solution is that many of them wanted to stay in Lebanon and realize that, you know, things were going to be tough because they'd been identified with Israel. The other situation is that certain members were brought into Israel. And at that time, there was an ongoing problem because they were put into Arab villages. It was felt that they were totally Arab, that they would want to be put into Arab villages. But in some of the Arab villages, they were criticized for having been supporters of the Israeli army. So uh, as Nancy mentions, always unintended consequences of war. It, I think it doesn't, really doesn't matter what kind of war and when it happens, there are always things that happen afterwards. My belief, by the way, is don't go into war until you know how you can get out of it. So the, <laughs> this is, I think, uh, just one other case study when I, I would say, try and avoid war where possible. Thank you. So um, thank you for um, this program, the third in our four-part series. Next week, uh, we talk about the government against the settlers and Gaza 2005. Israel is, uh, you know, full of great stories, challenging stories. And uh, that is certainly one that we, many of us remember. So we look forward to um, seeing you all back uh, next week for the finale much. in our series. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget, uh, we hope on Tuesday, July 20th, 10 a.m., to meet um, the, some Bedouin of Rahma, uh, for the sister city of um, the town in the Negev that we are doing our three-part series on, Yerucham. So um, I'm wishing you all a meaningful uh, Sunday at Tisha B'Av. And uh, Paul, thank you for, um, once again, teaching us. And lots of fans here in the CSP world from Orange County, including Steve Shulkoff and Mickey Shulkoff, who I can see there. It's good to see they're still hanging around CSP. And uh, of course, Bernice Watkin. I don't think Bernice talks to Mickey. And, well, certainly not Steve, but maybe Mickey. I don't know. Um, and also new people. Nancy Kaplan, thank you so much for your input. And I will share your recommendations with our group. Rosella Bernstein, it's good to see you. Take care, everybody. Have a great lunch break in California. Thank you. Bye.